we might not know what it looks like. And I think this is where we get stuck. We might know that we want to motivate people. We might know that we want to be in a business that provides a service. We have an idea of what it looks like. We often get too afraid to speak it out aloud or to claim what we want because we don't know how to get there. This is by Joey Joanne Season 2. I'm your host, Joanne Chan, and every Wednesday we bring you inspiring stories, powerful messages, and fun conversations with me and my special guests and friends. And it's my personal mission to empower you to live and lead a life with joy. This podcast is for you if you're looking for more joy, courage, passion, and purpose in your life. Now let's dive into today's episode and get ready to laugh, learn, and live your life to the fullest. As Australia's leading high-performance somatic coach with the lived experience of building and managing a $16 million business empire, she brings a rare blend of business mastery and profound personal transformation to the leadership space. Her coaching is not just about success on paper, it's also about embodying a leadership style that holds both your business and personal life in harmony. She offers high-level business strategy alongside somatic practices that create sustainable change, helping clients break through glass ceilings, overcome self-sabotage, and move beyond stress and burnout, all while preserving and enhancing their relationships. She's here today to empower you to soften into your power, to thrive in relationships, and have sustained business success without constant hustle. So guys, help me welcoming our guest today, the master coach, medicine woman, and creator of the Way of Grace, Leslie K. Leslie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for that in-depth introduction. I'm just really excited about meeting you today and having you on the show. So so, you know, when I was doing my research, as I told you, I um, you, you have spoken about growing up in a home shaped by addiction and abuse. Mm-hmm. And you moved out at just 14 years old. How did you overcome the trauma and develop the mindset and resilience needed at mm-hmm. such a young age? Yeah, Um. interestingly, I probably didn't overcome the trauma until recently. I built my success really on the back of avoiding that pain. Um, and I kind of ran away. I didn't run away from home. I spoke to my grandmother who I was living with at the time and told her I was moving out. But it's like I, I, I ran away from that childhood and I brought all of my trauma with me. And it's one of the things that I speak to or, and, you know, coach women through high achievers that, you know, I, I also, I want to say not all trauma is big trauma. Like I was raised by drug, drug addicts. I had a lot of abuse and chaos in my childhood, but if your parents sent you to boarding school or if they didn't tell you that they loved you or your parents got a divorce or, you know, trauma comes in all shapes and sizes. So I want to say that mostly we sort of run towards this future we think we want. And often what happens is we get there and we realize it's not everything it cracked up to be. So I didn't really um, process a lot of my trauma literally until four years ago, I started that journey. I kind of just knew that I didn't want to live at home because it was abusive. Then I moved in with a friend and then I eventually moved in with a boyfriend. And then um, when I was 17, I moved, I grew up in Jelton and I moved to Perth when I was 17 years old with my boyfriend at the time. And I kind of just kept running. It wasn't really, um, I didn't really overcome anything. I just uh, worked so hard that I pretended that it didn't happen. And I had this awareness that if I made money, I could leave my childhood behind, but it eventually caught up with me. That's a beautiful, I mean, it's painful, but it's a beautiful story and a lesson to learn that I can so relate to because I also moved out at 18 years old, basically. And um, and also because I was going through a lot of um you know, difficult times and, and trauma, I would say, um, as a child, right? So how do we process our trauma? Because you talk about you didn't really actually process the trauma until four years ago and um, you just kept running away, avoiding it. So how do we actually process our trauma? You have to feel it. <laughs> um, I know, you know, in these spaces, everyone says feel it to heal it, which is true. I also want to say, 
creating the safety to process it. So a lot of people can be afraid of facing themselves or facing their childhood, especially if they've accumulated success. And this is what was true for me because I was so afraid that if I healed that I wouldn't be me anymore. I wouldn't know how to be successful anymore. I had this awareness that, you know, I was working six days a week, 12 hours a day. And I had this awareness that um, it wasn't healthy. And that if I actually started to heal, that maybe I wouldn't be as successful as I was. And well, actually I continue to be, so I've proven that to be wrong, but yeah. Um, slowing down, actually listening to yourself. So oftentimes there's like a mean girl voice or this voice of doubt inside of our subconscious that that is talking to us or sometimes even yells at us and we tend to avoid it. We tend to shut it down or try to positive affirmation our way into a different thought process when actually true self-relationship comes from turning towards that voice and asking it what it's here to show you. Right. Okay, I want to... Okay, I want to continue the story a little because um, I know your grandfather also played a pivotal role in your life and offering love and belief that you mm. needed the most. So what was, um, I'm sure there are many, but what was one significant or profound lesson that he has taught you in life? Yeah, the, the biggest one which I remember to this day was respect. So, you know, he taught me how to shake hands and to have a strong, firm handshake and to look people in the eyes and to respect your elders. And I think in a world where, you know, manners and um, old school ethics and morals were kind of phasing out as I grew up, it it served me well because people give respect when they feel respected. And so I would always build relationships with people subconsciously because I had this element of like gratitude and respect, especially for like peers and mentors and elders. So I think that was a fundamental um, yeah, lesson that he taught me was, was respect for, for people that were guiding me and people that had something that they could teach me to help me on my path. Mm. I think the biggest one would be, you know, to, we have to respect ourselves as well. Right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Self-respect. So um, so four years ago, okay, what happened? Like, what was the moment that you realized, okay, I needed to heal myself, like, enough is enough? Like, what happened? It it started in stages. Um, so four years ago, my son was two, so I have a six-year-old. And I came home, I was at the helm of um, my first eight figure business. Uh, and I was like stressed and overwhelmed and constantly hustling and constantly working. And, you know, my son pretty much was raised by daycare and his grandparents because I cared more about making money and being a businesswoman at that time than I did as being a mum. And I came home from work one day and he did something and he, he just wanted my attention basically. And I snapped at him and I yelled at him and this is a two year old boy. And like, it was in that moment, I think the pain that I witnessed on his face and just this realization that my son just wanted me to love him. He didn't need me to make money. He didn't need me to be successful. He just wants my love. And there was a part of me that didn't feel capable of giving him the love that he wanted because I didn't actually love myself. I didn't know how to be present with him or myself. And I valued making money basically, or being successful more than I did being a mother. Not to say that mothers shouldn't be successful. I just, the way I view the world now is that I have a lot more balance and I, you know, we're often taught to sacrifice. Like I can't be a present mum and be successful. And I, you know, I can't, um, it's just a lot of can'ts. There's a lot of can'ts and a lot of rules that we fall into and I, which I don't subscribe to anymore. But yeah, I really thought that I had to sacrifice in order to be successful and, the, one of the first things was just this heartbreak of uh, not giving my son the love that he desired and deserved and kind of realizing that although maybe I wasn't a drug addict or an alcoholic or he wasn't being raised in abuse, that I also wasn't giving him the childhood that I desired either. And that really started my journey of self-inquiry. And I actually started breath work. And I say breath work was my gateway drug because that, <laughs> that um, yeah, it, 
I realized that I hadn't actually allowed myself to truly feel my emotions for most of my life. I'm sort of, uh, because of the trauma and because, you know, it was unsafe for me to feel that I'd sort of locked my emotions away and didn't allow myself to feel for like 30 years of my life. Mm. And I, I can, again, I can relate because we, I'm not sure if because of the world that we are living in right now is just being bombarded by social media and all the filters, right? Or what people are telling us, what we should do as women, especially, right? But, you know, for the longest time, I also think that we have, I have to sacrifice my, my, uh, my, my time with family, you know, or my relationship, my dating life in order to build a successful business or empire, as you call it. So, and uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And you are, you know, the perfect example. You have lived through this. So what advice would you give to, like, why why do we subscribe to this? And, and how do you help people to overcome these barriers? We subscribe to it because it's what people tell us is possible. So I, I talk about this often, actually. It's like, and what was true for me is I built a life that everyone else told me I should want. And then when I got there, I was like, actually, I don't, this isn't what I want. Not to say the success and the money wasn't what I wanted, but the way in which I built it. I, I think we're just so conditioned to believe that life requires sacrifice. And what I find that comes from is other people's limitations and other people's um, expectations of themselves and the world around them. And, you know, if we tell ourselves it's not possible often enough, it's not possible. And so we have to be really careful with who we're taking advice from, whether it's our parents or our peers or mainstream society. There's a lot of narrative around, yeah, sacrifice and control and kind of being good little boys and girls. I don't like to go too far down conspiracy theories, but, um, you know, we're sent to school and we're literally taught to be good boys and good girls. We're literally taught to follow the status quo. We're literally taught to fall in line and do what's right and all of these other sorts of things. And, yeah, I, it takes courage to actually say I'm not going to be like everyone else and I'm going to choose a life where I get to have everything. And for me, this became really evident when I was at the helm of my success or the peak of my success and and I had a marriage and my ex-husband's a beautiful man, but we had a very um, passionless relationship. And because he was a good man, everyone, when I separated from him, couldn't understand why. Like, why would you leave him? He's a good man. And it really just highlighted for me this um, intrinsic belief that one, we can pair a lot, like, well, it could be worse, so I'm just going to keep what I've got. And for me, it was like, well, I have a successful business and I have a husband that loves me, even though I don't feel loved and I don't feel passion or desire and we have no sex life, I should just be happy with what I've got. And I, it could be worse. At least he's not abusing me, for example. And as soon as I started to remove that narrative and I started to ask myself the question, well, what if I could have it all? What would it look like if I allowed my, gave myself permission to have it all? What, what would it look like if I gave myself permission to believe that it is possible to have deeply fulfilling relationships and highly successful businesses? And what belief systems do I need to create in my own psychology, nervous system, belief system, subconscious in order to believe that's possible? And this is where I first started, probably wasn't the first time, but consciously first started to form the belief of like borrowing belief. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is like listening to podcasts, finding teachers, actually being in the energy and in conversations with people that have it all, that have the relationship, that have the business, that have the health and have the wealth. And it's from this place that I was like, well, if they have it, why can't I have it too? And what am I believing that makes me think that I can't have everything that I want? Mm. And really from there, I started to form this belief that actually if we want something bad enough, we can have it. We often just get stuck in comparison and gratitude is really important, but I want to say there's almost this false gratitude of we should be grateful so we shouldn't want more. And it's not about not being grateful for what we have or, or, you know, being 
ungrateful. I remember you're ungrateful, you're ungrateful, you're ungrateful. It's not about that. It's about knowing what's possible and doing whatever it takes to create a life where you have everything you want. Mm, I love that. Yeah. So often when we talk about success, it's all about how much money you make, you know, right? And um, but your journey, you build an empire, you're a successful woman, and your but your journey goes beyond the financial success. So how do you define true success now? Is it to have it all? Like that's like your definition of success right now? Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I kind of walk the middle path. Um, I don't subscribe to denouncing money. I think money is a great vessel to highlight how much you love yourself, actually. Like, wouldn't you want to only eat organic and only fly business class around the world and pay for whatever education or training or healing that you want to do or, you know, buy the clothes that that not only look good but feel good and are sustainable, which has a higher price tag? So for me, conversations around money are interesting because I think people can assume that um, if you have more of a holistic lifestyle or you're more concerned about well-being that you don't care about money, that's not true. I love myself enough that I want a private jet one day because I don't want to have to work to someone else's schedule. But for me, it's the motivation behind why. Um, and, you know, I want to say it's also the people that you share it with and the journey that you take along the way, that's the most important. Wealth for me is, you know, being able to sleep in to 10 a.m. if I'm feeling like I need some extra time. It is being able to take a week off and actually not be on my phone or be immersed in work. It is picking my son up from school every day. Um, it's building a life around what I desire, not around who and what people told me I could have or what that looks like. And how did you, I'm just curious. Okay, so for people, I know my listeners, they are, um, I would say half of them are entrepreneurs, half of them are still stuck, or I wouldn't say stuck, you know, are still in a nine to five job, right? And um, so how do you help people to create a life? I would say, okay, how about this? Um, how would you help people who come from, people who just like you, you know, who come from a difficult background and um, they don't have the luxury of money, could be, you know, education, but aspire to rise above and create their own empire or business or anything or financial freedom. How, where, do, where should they start? You know, what should they do? Yeah, I have a really interesting view. I call bullshit on people that say they don't have the resources because I came from nothing and nobody helped me. I just really prioritized what was important. So, you know, most people were out partying. I was studying. I love or that. Yeah. Or like people were stuck in victim and I was out like figuring out a way. And I hustled, like I hustled hard. You know, I even, um, I I even like when I was like 18 years old, went and did topless waitressing for nine months, literally because I was like, I don't care how I'm going to do this, but I am going to do this. And I think people get caught in the, I don't know, the vict and victim mentality, especially. And I, and I don't say that, you know, like it, some people's circumstances stuck, some people suck. Some people are born into chaos and overwhelm, but I never used it as an excuse. I used it as a motivator. And I want to say we all have a choice. We can use these things to motivate us to move away from what we want or we can use them to stay stuck in, in what we don't want. $14 a week, you can get an audible subscription. Every lesson that you need to be successful in business, you can access on YouTube, on audible, on podcasts. Yeah. So you can even access it for free if you really want. Yeah. What, what we lack is motivation. What we lack is belief that it's possible. What we lack is, um, yeah, like the clarity of, of we're not defined by our circumstances, we're defined by our choices. And every morning, you know, I didn't have a conscious awareness of this, but every morning I would wake up and I would, I would hold this vision or this knowing that I was made for more. And I just kept moving towards that knowing. Now, my journey wasn't smooth sailing. I didn't move out of home when I was 14 and then boom, $60 million empire. I did topless waitressing for nine months. I took drugs every night for nine months. I uh, 
I, I would be in jobs for like nine months or 12 months and then quit until I was 21 and I landed in, in my recruitment career. But I want to say I never used the tough times as an excuse. I used them to keep evolving. Now, I didn't fully consciously heal my wounds until four years ago, but I've always been really big on personal growth and development. So it's not like I went into my trauma and did any healing, but I would always like listen to motivational podcasts or educate myself on selling, for example. Like the quickest and easiest way to make money is learn how to sell. Now, it's funny because... I actually attest a lot of my sales um, experience to being a topless waitress for nine months because I learned to hustle and I learned to manipulate. Now, that's not the most ethical way to sell. And it played a part in my journey to become the woman that I am today. And when I had more awareness and grew more, the way that I sold and the way that I showed up in the world changed. But I used every stepping stone whether it was a good stepping stone or a bad stepping stone to a, like I talk about failing forward as an entrepreneur. In fact, all of the mistakes or lessons I made up until I was 21 was a way for me to fail forward, was a way for me to sort of go, okay, well, I made a mistake here, but I'm not going to stop myself from continuing to move in the direction of the woman that I know I'm here to be. And borrowing belief, you know, podcasts have saved my life on more than one occasion because I found the voices of the people that I wanted to be like, and I like clung to them with this almost desperation at times of like, well, if this person exists, then I know it's possible. I just need to figure out a way for it to be possible for me too. That's powerful and so beautiful. And that's the power of podcasting. And that's why I love podcasting so much. And that's why we are doing a podcast together. And I know this episode, what you just said, is gonna be it's gonna help so many people. And um, so thank you so much just for saying that, you know, for sharing that. Now, yeah, talking about your failures, um, you had you have had a three million dollar tax debt, right? And yes. a divorce, being a single mom. I know you talk about, you know, now looking back, everything was, um, you were feeling forward, but I'm sure in that moment, or just like one single moment, you don't know what to do, what to do next, you know, how to get out of that. And you're just like, so depressed, right? And devastated. How did you find in the moment? How did you, what did you tell yourself? How did you find the strength to start over and, you know, emerge stronger? Yeah. When I started to heal, you know, and actually the decision to leave my ex-husband was made off the back of actually realizing I'd ignored myself for all of my life. And the decision to leave my husband, I didn't make lightly, but I realized that I'd never actually put myself first my whole life. You know, I helped raise my younger, um, my younger sisters. Uh, my mum had them and they were born drug addicts and I helped my Nana raise them. And then they moved in with me when I was 21 and then didn't move out until like five years later when I was engaged. And in that, like in that decision, in that moment, in, in that choice to actually start to pay attention to my little girl, to the, the little girl inside of me that needed my love and attention, it was actually, I want to say it was quite easy because the promise I made to myself when I made that decision was I will never ignore you again. I will never put you last again. I will never choose you last again. Like I will choose you first in every circumstance from here on out. After years of self-abandoning, years of ignoring my own needs. And so in the moments where and I still have them, I want to say, like no one's immune to, I call them like come to God moments where you get pulled to your knees in life or business or relationship or whatever it is, you know, solo parenting and trying to figure it all out when no one actually taught you how to mother yourself. I remember the first time, you know, I, I dealt with my trauma by blocking out emotion. So I used to joke and say I was a good entrepreneur because I never actually felt any emotions. I wouldn't really cry. I wouldn't get angry. I'd get frustrated, but not really angry because I was so locked down emotionally. And because of that, it meant I could only feel my happiness for fleeting moments. Like I'd be happy and it would be gone like that. But the first time that I allowed myself to feel my emotions was um, a couple of weeks after I asked my ex-husband to move out. And it was like all this emotion started flooding in and it was 
was one of the most intense moments of my life where, you know, I was like on my knees, like feeling like I was getting ripped open from the inside out and not knowing whether I was going to survive all of the emotion that I was feeling. Um, and, and genuinely called my ex-husband and I was like, I'd like, I don't know if I'm going to survive this basically. And in those moments, honestly, like just this one, I mean, whether it's God or source or universe or whatever you believe in, I had this realization that I was never, ever really alone and that there was a higher power guiding me. And if I look back at all of the choice points in my life, it's like God kept on saying, just keep going, just one more step, just follow this direction. I've gotten really good at listening to those nudges from the universe now. And also I was always with me. I, even in the moments where I abandoned myself or made said yet said yes when I meant to say no I was always there and so making this promise to myself you know even as I'm dating now and 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 re, you know re-entering relationship world it's like I will never ever 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 not choose me first ever again I didn't um come this far to go back on that promise that I made to myself and any times where it feels overwhelming or it feels like uh, life gets too much or solo parenting gets too much or building another business gets too much. I literally remember the promise that I made to that little girl to be like, I will never leave you ever again. And that's my guiding light that the, my self love, my self relationship, the trust that I've built with myself, it's not worth not being this deeply connected with myself. Like nothing's worth it. Yeah. And and now I think you're coaching people how to achieve success without the constant hustle, right? How to have pressure and play in your journey to achieving success and why is it so important? Um, and um, because I know I for a longer time again, I it's so hard to believe, right? I can I can play and achieve success. I just I just couldn't do it, right? So how how have you found abundance, success, prosperity, fulfillment through play and pressure? Yeah. Um, we're pleasure seeking beings. <laughs> so we either run away from pain or we chase pleasure. We're actually quite hedonistic at heart. And so when we can tap into that in our business, when we can find a deeper purpose. So for me, I'm in service. I'm devoted to allowing women to live full lives. Like I don't want to see another woman like I was living a half life or accepting a half love. I know that pain. I know that emptiness. I, I know that past. And, you know, the pleasure for me is watching women transform. The pleasure for me is women coming to me to help them to move from 500K to a million dollars in their business and messaging me to say, it's not even about the money anymore. I think you're going to save my marriage. Mm. That is where I get my joy from. Like, the pain that I went through is actually in service to something greater. I get to be in service to the evolution of humanity through my capacity to guide women into their hearts and into their truth and to soften into leadership that feels nurturing and not, yeah, you know, I don't buy into hustle culture and sometimes we need periods of focus. And I, you know, the difference is when we pour from devotion, when we pour from being in service, when we come into our business with this overwhelming sense of gratitude and overflow and, you know, it, it almost feels like something else is moving us. We don't feel like we're working. We're just in service to our mission. And I do a lot of work on values and purpose with women because sometimes we either lose our purpose along the way or we've never actually stopped and asked ourselves what our values and pur purpose and mission is. And for me, when we start to tap into this motivation from a place of devotion to our purpose, we don't get overwhelmed, we don't hustle. And like psychologically, if you need to be motivated to do something, it's actually likely not in line with your values. And in order to find the motivation, we need to either link it to our values or this is where we start to outsource and we can stay in our zone of genius and actually just do what we enjoy and not try to keep forcing ourselves to do things that don't actually feed into our purpose. 
Yeah, it's interesting because when I talk about, when I ask you the question about pressure and play, what I have in mind is about not doing what I am or anyone supposed to be doing or, you know, start a business, you know, read a book or, you know, watch a YouTube, but instead they're just Netflix and chill, right? So that's what I have in mind um, for pressure and play, you know, just being lazy and I would never do that. But, you know, but for me, podcasting is fun, it's play, it doesn't feel like work, although it's my business, but it doesn't feel like work. So um, how about for people who are just like, not motivated, unmotivated, they are lazy, they don't have, they don't have a purpose in life. Where do they start? Like, they don't even know what their purpose is. Mm. You do. I actually want to say you do know. I call bullshit on people that say that they don't. I want to say you're afraid of it. Mm. Um, in that we all know, we might not know what it looks like. And I think this is where we get stuck. We might know that we want to motivate people. We might know that we want to be in a business that provides a service. We have an idea of what it looks like. We often get too afraid to speak it out aloud or to claim what we want because we don't know how to get there. Um, laziness that. is an interesting thing, right? Because, you know, I have days where I lay in the sun and 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 don't do anything, you know, there's like passive and passive ways to do business and and almost like rather than being um, driving towards a direction. Like sometimes I study, but to me, that's still working on my business. I get, so I have like non-negotiables that I do every day, um, communication, posting, um, connection. And I, and I will do these foundational pieces, which truthfully takes me about two hours. Any work I do outside of that is either serving a client or I'm in the strategy on how I'm going to grow my business, but I don't have to do that every day. I choose to do it most days, but if I woke up tomorrow and I was like, do you know what? I'm feeling a bit off. Um, I'm feeling a bit heavy or I'm not feeling as motivated then rather than beat myself up or, you know, completely isolate myself or get into overwhelm or stop, I'll do my non-negotiables. And then I will do something that's actually moving the needle in my life and my business, but in a way that feels more nourishing than it does um, draining. So I will literally like go lay in the sun and study, or I will run a bath and study, or I will batch my content because I just want to do that. Like, yeah, like laying in the bath or laying in the sun or something, or I'll go for a walk and listen to a podcast. Oftentimes stagnancy or laziness comes from lack of movement. Mm -hmm. And so a good hack is like, if I'm not feeling motivated, I'll actually go for a walk because um, if you look at the quantum physics, energy that's moving wants to keep moving. And so sometimes staying stuck and staying stagnant, like laying around on the couch watching Netflix is our way of staying out of the momentum. So I will get up and move. It's, you know, I rarely watch Netflix, but sometimes I have a binge. And when I do, I notice that because I'm stagnant, I want to stay stagnant. Yeah. And then I literally almost have to like kickstart myself again. So I'll go for a walk and listen to a podcast. And, you know, I'm always studying. I'm I'm a nerd like that. I just love knowledge. So for me, if I'm feeling like having an off day, I use it as a study day instead. And that way I'm, I'm kind of like hacking um, my own leadership because I'm still moving towards a version of me I want to become because I'm studying something that's going to help me or my clients or my life in general. Well, I love that. I mean, yeah. And you talk about movement is um, I think that's why, because you are a somatic coach, right? It's all about feeling I don't know why I'm not a somatic coach but it's like about feeling your your body your emotions and moving through the emotions right so talk to me about that like what is somatic? yeah so so you know I sit in the intersection of strategy and, and psychology I'm not a psychologist yet but I'm working on it um and somatics for me is the bridge in the body mind connection and the biggest um, revelation that comes for women in my world is they have an awareness of their limiting beliefs so they have an awareness of the places that they're stuck or they have a, a logical awareness of why things aren't moving. But it's like they're stuck in that loop of having awareness but not being able to break out of it. And the body-mind connection for me is bringing the awareness into the body and integrating our awareness with somatic action what I mean by that is if you feel 
unmotivated, for example, if you close your eyes and breathe into your body, you can ask your body where it feels unmotivated. It might feel unmotivated in its legs or your solar plexus or your heart. And then if you start to ask that part of you questions, like, why do you feel unmotivated? Let's say it was in your heart. Let's say I close my eyes and I'm like taking three breaths, making sure you're breathing down into the bottom of your belly. Now, I'm not feeling unmotivated, but let's say I was, and I said, look, I feel unmotivation and I feel it in my heart because I felt this before. What I actually find if I ask this place that feels unmotivated questions is maybe I was feeling unmotivated because I was afraid that if I became more successful, I wasn't going to be loved. And so when we bridge the gap in the body-mind connection, we find out the the integrated reason why we're not moving where we're moving and we can get into our subconscious mind not our conscious mind so when we're making decisions from our thoughts from our active thoughts it's from our prefrontal cortex which is our ego and so we're consciously making decisions so our our body and if we relax into it enough and our nervous system our parasympathetic nervous system is where our subconscious thoughts and beliefs and patterns are stored and when we can drop into that part of our our nervous system and our subconscious, this is where we get to the truth of why maybe we're not doing the things we say we want to do. Maybe we're not feeling motivated. Maybe we're not um, taking the action steps to move from where we are to where we want to be. So the quickest and simplest way is breath work. Breath work is, like I said at the beginning, it's like my it was my gateway drug into a spiritual awakening because it took me out of my mind into my body and into my subconscious and I was able to relief, re, re, release patterns and beliefs that were stored there in order for me to move into the version of the woman that I am today. Beautiful. Yeah, I done a bit of breath work, then I stopped. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, just like anything, right? I didn't see any significant change. And I thought, oh, it's working. But anyway, I'm going to go back to my practice soon after hearing this, uh, after talking to you. Um, so the last thing I want to talk to you about is your signature program, Way of Grace. Um, it offers a new leadership paradigm. So what does it mean? And also I said in, in the introduction, what does it mean to soften into your power and how can we embody this you talk about the feminine energy and the masculine energy how can we embody both and you know both energies in our leadership roles or in anything we do yes i love this um soft feminine leadership you know i, I think when people hear feminine or softness they think of weakness mm. and the reason it's way of grace because grace for me is power grace for me is is you know like if you think of a rose a rose is beautiful and it's got thorns. For me, the integration of power and strength and softness and receivership is grace. It's knowing who you are so intrinsically that you can claim your place in the world as a leader, but it's also knowing when we need to be nurturing, when we need to be more loving, when we need to lead with our hearts, with ourselves firstly, and then with the world around us. And Way of Grace was formed because I wasn't that graceful when I first started this journey. I didn't have the right support systems. I didn't understand myself deep enough. I didn't have anyone that could hold this pillar of big business success with integrating uh, self-relationship and actually doing the healing work that it sometimes takes to be successful in business. And so Way of Grace is really the journey into this powerful feminine leadership that creates a life that feels as good as it looks. And I think we're so caught up in building a life that looks good that we forget about making sure it feels good. And this is the embodiment of having everything that we want. It's the life with it all for me. It's it's the the big business and the deeply connected relationships. It's the single mother and the businesswoman. And it's the capacity to hold grace for yourself and grace for your journey and find harmony in these masculine and feminine energies. And what I mean by that, and I try not to use these words, and if you're new to it, like masculine principles is really drive direction purpose. They're masculine qualities. Feminine qualities are nurturing, surrender, receptivity, love, and we need both. Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I don't have masculine qualities. And um, the more you understand this work, the more you realize that 
we need both of those energies to have harmony internally. And to have harmony means we have safety. And the more safety we build in our body-mind connection, so that means somatically with our nervous system and intellectually with our understanding, the more we're inclined to build the life we want because we feel, feel safe to do so. And so by having a strong masculine container, and this is why I have non-negotiables. So I have two hours a day where I do my non-negotiables in my business, and that's structure, which is a masculine principle. So we need structure to hold our feminine expression. And our feminine expression is more in the pleasure and the play. And again, that could be being in service, like serving for me is playful. It's pleasurable. I love helping women. It could be going to the beach at lunchtime. It could be going for a walk and listening to a podcast. It's something that feels good, not just is making you money or is going to get you advancement in your life or your business. For me, it's the, what are we doing this for? And if we're not enjoying ourselves, there really is no point. Yeah. If you are not having fun, what is the point, right? After all, you know, I really love that. I, I've written it down. Uh, we need our masculine structure to hold our feminine expression, something like that, right? It's not exactly what it's yes. that it just perfectly describes what why do we need both, right? So thank you so much again. This is really like I would say this is this is a lot better than what I expected it to be in this conversation, <laughs> to be very honest. I'm just like mind blown right now and I, I have no words. So is there anything else that you really want to talk about? Perhaps I didn't ask you then let you no, just that um, find people that have the belief systems and the lifestyle you're looking for and don't be afraid to reach out. And again, whether it's podcasts, whether it's audiobooks, whether it is getting a coach, um, move before you're ready. One of my biggest tips for entrepreneurs or people that want to be entrepreneurs is fail forward. Move before you're ready. Success loves movement. Um yeah. And just to keep showing up for yourself. It's, you know, success isn't a linear path. Like I said, I didn't leave home and then become a millionaire overnight. There was lots of slips and trips and side quests and mistakes. And, you know, some moments I wasn't even sure that I was going to make it through or, you know, the the allure of just falling victim to my circumstances and ending up, you know, like staying in whether it's taking drugs or doing topless waitressing or or you know not actually living up to my potential that that pull was strong i understand what it feels like to take the to to want to take the easy road i think one of the biggest fears that i hear from people and it sure sure is true for myself is like the fear of unlived potential like the fear of knowing that you had more inside of you to give and you just gave up on giving it. Mm. And I think really f using that as your like North star or guiding light to be like, actually the last six months of my life may have sucked, but I'm going to wake up today and I'm going to make better choices and I'm going to move in the direction of the version of me that I know I'm here to become. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, this is not the end because we always end with our final five rapid fire questions. Now, every question um has to be answered in one word or one sentence maximum. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Let's play. Awesome. The first question is, what is one thing you wish you knew earlier? Mm, you can't outsource self-love. I love that. I just love everything you said in this episode, to be honest. Second question. If you could relive one day of your life, which day would it be? Mm. Oh, so many. <laughs> the day that I learned to feel again. Beautiful. I, I just have ghost bomb, like, hearing that. So powerful. If you could master one skill you don't currently have, what would it be? Oh, if I could master one skill that I don't. Honestly, marketing. I thought you are great at marketing. You built an empire. I know, but it's, it's, it's an ever-evolving, um, yes. I want to say, ecosystem. Mm. So it does take a lot of devotion and commitment to understanding how to make it work. Mm, yeah, interesting. Yeah. 
the next question is, if you could instantly solve one world problem, what would it be? Um, oh, one word or sentence. Oh, it could be a more than that. <laughs> yeah, so so it would actually be, I want to say the, the endemic or crisis of, of people abandoning themselves. Like the reason I do this work is because there's so many people living half lives and accepting half love that, you know, I don't think we would get divorced or divorce wouldn't be as hectic as it was if we actually went into our relationships knowing who we are. Mm. Yep. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. The last question is, of course, what brings you the greatest joy? Being in service. Being in service. Like messages like the women that I get that come to me thinking that I'm going to help them make more money and I actually help save their relationships. Like, yeah, i I would wake up broke every day just to feel that um feel that sensation or that that meeting of my purpose in this life. Yeah, you're doing such a beautiful work. I mean, thank you so much for everything you do. Now, tell my people where they can find you and connect with you if they want to join your program, what with you, where should they go? Yeah, Instagram, I'm most active. Um Leslie at Leslie K look in the notes for how to spell it because I like to be different and my name is spelt with a z uh, yeah add me on Instagram slide into my dms it's me it's not someone else so send me a voice note say hello and if you have any questions I'll be happy to answer it now thank you so much again for coming and guys I hope I know you love today's episode because you're listening to the very end so go follow Leslie on her Instagram thank her for coming today ask her any question if you have any and if you're listening I would love to hear it from you too take a screenshot and share it in an IG story and tell us what is your biggest takeaway from this episode remember to take me and also take Leslie in the post don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss another episode coming to you every Wednesday and I will always leave you the same way as I leave with every other episode show Show up. The world needs you and you need you. Thanks for listening and I wish you all a joyful and amazing day ahead. Bye. Thank you again for tuning into Find Joy Joanne podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, take a screenshot and share it on your IG story and take Find Joy Joanne underscore podcast so I know you are listening. And leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts if you haven't already done so. And remember to hit the subscribe button whether you are listening on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music or any of your other favorite platforms. If you love what we are doing and want to become one of our sponsors, you can send me a DM to connect. And thanks for being here. I will see you soon in the next episode.